After Karl Marx facilitated his theory on the class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, with the bourgeoisie being the oppressive class and the proletariat being the oppressed, the belief of workers being exploited in the free market arose. Even despite the failures of socialism in the real world outside of theory, socialists continue to insist that workers are exploited under capitalism. The main principle on which this theory rests is that workers are forced to sell their labor power for less than what it is truly worth. The socialists, especially the Marxian kind, will tell you that the capitalists profit off the worker's labor and that the worker creates the product's value, while the capitalist takes value from the worker and gives them only a small part of the wealth they created. In short, the capitalist exploits and steals from the worker. Profit is ultimately theft from the worker. This principle, like other socialist principles, are fallacies. The class struggle theory in, in and in of itself is wrong because of the simple fact that economic classes are not entities, do not act, and do not have their own self-interests. Economic classes are merely collections of various individuals grouped together by the amount of wealth they possess, and every other regard they can be completely different, including how they gained or how they have a lack of wealth. Only individuals think act, and gain wealth by trading, cooperating, or competing against other individuals. Thus, there exists no such thing as an oppressive or oppressed economic classes, nations, ethnic groups, or other collections of individuals. However, this video is not about that. This video is about disproving the popular fallacies created by the socialists, and to prove that workers are not being exploited in the free market. The main topic surrounding the debate between the socialists and the capitalists is the relationship between labor and capital, the labor theory of value slash surplus value, and time preference. Firstly, the relationship between labor and capital. Capital, contrary to the beliefs of the Marxists, is not an all-powerful thing that can magically generate profit. It must be employed in the most efficient way to create a product that is actually in demand, meaning that consumers value this product and will willingly per will and will willingly purchase it compared to other products. Labor is a specific action performed by an individual and his physical body. Every individual has ownership over their own physical body, and thus each individual owns exclusively owns and controls their labor, and is the only person who can decide what to do with his labor. Either he uses labor for himself to appropriate and create products which he himself can consume, or he sells his labor to another individual. By choosing to work for an employer, he sells his labor and time for a specific price, which is the wage. Labor has no inherent value. It only has value if other individuals agree that it does. The wage is determined by how high someone is willing to pay the worker, how low the worker is willing to receive, how rare someone's skill is, which is the supply, and how many people want the labor, which is the demand. Labor, just like goods or services, has a market price determined based off supply and demand. The capitalist has ownership over capital and provides the worker with the necessary equipment, tools, and land needed to do the work. Since the capitalist has ownership over capital, given the name capitalist, he must incur all the necessary expenses while sustaining it, such as repairing equipment, maintaining a building, funding research, etc. The worker does not incur any of these expenses, or rather he does not lose any money at all by working for the capitalist. He is not in ownership of the capital, land, or any other component in the business. Since he is not an ownership of the capital, he does not incur the expenses associated with capital, but he also naturally does not gain the revenue that the capital can possibly generate if put to use by the capitalist to make a specific product. In addition, capital doesn't last forever and does wear out and break, and even in its useful life the value of it decreases over time. This is called depreciation. The capitalist pays for all the necessary elements, namely land, labor, and capital. He either purchases ownership over or rents land, such as a building, pays for ownership and to maintain capital, and pays for the work and pays the worker for his labor. The capitalist then combines them all into one product, which depending on how how much consumers value that product, determines the profits or losses for the entrepreneur or capitalist. 
If consumers purchase the product in large enough quantities for the revenue to exceed the expenses, which means that many individuals value the product more highly than the cost needed to create it, the entrepreneur, owners of a business, or shareholders of a corporation make a profit, or in the case of the shareholders, the price of the share increases, given that a share is a fraction of a corporation. If the opposite is the case, where the expenses exceed the revenue, when most consumers of a specific market do not value a product highly enough to purchase it at the price point it is priced at, the entrepreneur, owners of a business, or shareholders of a corporation lose money, they have a deficit, or again, the price of their share decreases in this case. In short, the entrepreneur or corporation profits to the extent that they are able to satisfy the demands of the public. The more they profit, the better they have satisfied the desires of the consumers. Secondly, the labor theory of value and surplus value. The labor theory of value states that the economic value of a good or service is determined by the total amount of socially necessary labor on average required to produce it. Surplus value is a principle built on the labor theory of value. It is the difference between the amount raised through the sale of a product and the amount it costs the owner of the product to manufacture it. Surplus value then, in the context of a labor theory of value, effectively means surplus labor time. Value is not determined through a specific, quali through a specific quality of the product, such as costs or utility, nor how much labor is required to create the product. Value is determined by how much an acting individual places importance on a particular good or how much he is willing to pay to receive it. What Marx and earlier Ricardo and Smith did was confuse objective cost with subjective value. Even if a product costs $10, the value of that product may be different person to person. One person may only value it at $5, and they would never go into that exchange, as $5 is more valuable for that individual than that product. If another person values it at $30, then that product would seem like a bargain even at $20, and he values the product substantially more than $10, and thus goes into the exchange. Thus, as a consumer, you do not consider either the cost or profit of others. You only consider the possible benefit you derive from an economic good. Since the economy is the subject evaluation of economic products, and for trade to exist, both sides have to benefit from the arrangement, the free market economy cannot be a zero-sum game. Therefore, the economy is not a zero-sum game. All individuals benefit from the voluntary trade of goods, services, and labor to fulfill the desires of ones who need and want it most. In an example of the employer and the employee, the employer has money and needs labor and the employee has a specific skill, labor, and needs money. The employer values the labor the employee has more than a specific amount of money he gives up. Let's just say $20 an hour for this particular example. The employee values $20 per hour more than the labor and time he gives up. So the employer receives his desired labor. They value more than the money he gave away. And the employee receives the desired money. They value more than the labor and time they gave away. In short, both receive what they value more than what they gave away. Both benefit and are in, and are in an economically better position than before the voluntary trade of labor, time, and money. So if value is subjective and, can, and cannot be objectively measured, either in costs or in labor, it is ridiculous to assume that more value can go in than out for the worker, as the worker's labor is different from the economic product he produces, and thus can sell for very different prices on the market. Hell, even the worker's labor can be valued substantially differently by different individuals. In addition, when the capitalist loses money and has a deficit, the worker still gets paid his voluntarily agreed upon consistent wage. The value of the labor did not change in relation to the worker and the capitalist. However, the value of the product that the capitalist is selling for consumers has changed. Consumers no longer value the product as much as they did before. Thirdly, the theory of time preference. Time preference is the current relative valuation of placed on goods or money at an earlier date compared with receiving it at a later date. Time preference is essentially that individuals prefer a given end to be achieved sooner rather than later. 
Time is scarce, and individuals must act within a certain period of time to achieve their self-interests. A lower time preference means that individuals would rather spend time to improve their production and pr to improve their production process and defer consumption. On the other hand, a higher time preference means that individuals would rather consume almost immediately rather than deferring and saving or investing money. Savings are the result of individuals deferring consumption and using money not for present day consumption, but either for future consumption or production. An investment, meanwhile, is a transfer of labor and land to the formation of capital goods, meaning the resources are used to create capital goods. An example of higher and lower time preference is the worker and the entrepreneur. In this example, the worker receives a consistent and guaranteed $10 per hour and works for 8 hours a day, assuming he adequately does his labor, which is equivalent to sixteen, which is equivalent to $1,600 a month. An entrepreneur has the possibility of receiving $5,000 of revenue in a month. However, consumption must be delayed during this time to purchase the necessary capital goods, which costs around $2,000. So assuming everything goes well for the entrepreneur and they, were, and they are able to sell their product and make the expected $5,000 of revenue, they receive a profit of $3,000. Time preference will decide, in this example, whether one will become the worker or the entrepreneur. The worker receives less theoretical total money for selling his labor than selling a consumer good created by the capital goods, $1,600 versus $3,000. However, the worker, unlike the entrepreneur, is guaranteed that amount, again, assuming he adequately does his labor. The worker receives $1,600 almost no matter what. Meanwhile, the entrepreneur receives $3,000 of profit only in one scenario. Another scenario, which could be the worst case scenario, where the entrepreneur cannot sell any of their product and thus incurs a deficit of $2,000, which means they lose $2,000. The worker not only doesn't want to possibly lose money in the investment of capital, they also want a consistent, guaranteed, and immediate pay. They do not want a fluctuating income or even the chance of losing money. Meanwhile, the entrepreneur defers consumption and invests in capital. Their income is determined by how many, consu how many consumer goods they can sell at a specific price. Depending on how many consumers purchase their product, they can either make more money than the worker around the same, less, or even possibly lose money and have a deficit. Thus, the worker generally has a t higher time preference compared to the entrepreneur's generally lower time preference. The worker wants a payment for his labor to consume without investing or having, or having any other expenses. This is compared to the entrepreneur who defers consumption, invests money into capital, and has expenses as a result of capital ownership with no immediate reward. Another argument that socialists push, typically, especially in the modern day, is the equality argument, which is generally a moral argument. They argue that people are too unequal under capitalism, and there must be more equality. However, hierarchies and inequality are a natural phenomena among men. Every individual has, this, has different and distinct skills, values, attributes, abilities, goals, desires, time preferences, and many other differences. Inequality and the division of labor are inherent in the nature of man, and equality has to be forced through the actions of a centralized, coercive, violent, and destructive state. In addition to that, economic mobility is very prevalent in market economies. Capital goods change hands, and it is possible to start a business without much capital at all. A person who is born relatively poor can become well-to-do or even rich by, def by making smart economic decisions, such as deferring consumption, investing in capital goods, buying shares of corporations and correctly predicting the stock market, or and creating a product which consumers purchase. These, all these economic decisions require a low time preference. A person who has inherited a line of industries and thus is rich can lose all of his capital and land ownership if he cannot pay the expenses to maintain it, that is if he overspends and consumes without accounting for savings or cannot generate a revenue, a quality of high time preference. Many rich people can and do go bankrupt 
which means that they are legally declared insolvent because they cannot pay their debts because of their poor economic planning or simply a case of bad decision making. The final and probably the most pitiful argument used by socials is the classic capitalism creates poverty. A question for these individuals, can the inherent characteristics of humanity, such as needing to work to sustain yourself, be blamed on any particular system? For, the, for millennia of human existence, individuals were mostly poor by modern standards, had a low life expectancy, and did not have nearly the amount of comfort and wealth we possess now. Poverty is in fact the natural state of humanity for most of man's history and only after capitalism, free global trade and industrialization arose did this change. Capitalism and free global trade reduced the amount of individuals living in extreme poverty, defined as living of just $2 a day, accounting for inflation from 85% in 1800 to 9% in 2022. This should be more than enough for me and all rational people to proclaim that capitalism does not create poverty, it solves it with resounding and proven success. Under a capitalist system, all individuals have the freedom to freely act within private property and the natural law, including, but not limited to, selling their labor, transferring ownership of capital goods, using capital goods to create a product which other individuals want and value, and exchanging goods, services, and labor at voluntarily determined market prices under a medium of exchange with a highly scalable and representative unit of cost, which is determined by supply and demand. Capitalism, which is the voluntary exchange, cooperation, and competition of man to supply the needs of others, is the only way to improve human life, the only way to stop this organic, hierarchical, natural, and peaceful system of the creation and exchange of wealth is by using force and the involuntary confiscation of property, namely, namely through expropriation and taxes. Thank you for watching this video, goodbye, and enjoy the rest of your day.